And I have to say that she read that very well. I was quite impressed. I can't wait, Mackenzie, until you do that again. We could almost sit down or just say amen and go home, but we're not going to. You know, as I, I was pondering upon Mother's Day, I was thinking, what can I do? What mother can I focus upon? Could it be Hannah? Now, Hannah's a good story for Mother's Day, but I've already done that one before. But what about Leah? And then the thought came to me, we're in a series of Joseph. And I have never heard a mother's sermon on Rachel. Have you? Has anybody? So I thought, it's a challenge. I'm going to try it. And so we're going to be looking a little bit at the story of Rachel. Now, I want to tell you, there are some things about Rachel that came to my mind. It seemed like Rachel had a challenging life. Would you agree with that? If you read anything about her, you would say, wow, there was an interesting character. But I want to focus upon two concepts of Rachel. I want to take a look at recognizing her for who she is. And sometimes we have to take a look at the children as a product of the mother. Because very little is said about Rachel being a mother that we're going to focus a little bit upon her children and what outstanding characters they had. And then, of course, the dedication. My hat is off to every mother here because you are dedicated in raising your children in the Lord. Amen? And so we're going to take a look at Rachel's dedication. But as I was talking or focusing upon the recognition of Rachel, I came across some key points. Some of them are pretty obvious. The first one is that her name was you. Some of you said it. I heard it. Someone said sheep. Now, how would you like to um, say your wife looks like a sheep? Now, some of you might think, well, that's pretty, pretty scary. But if you take a look at the book of Song of Solomons, and take a look at Song of Solomons, or Song of Psalms, chapter 4, it is very descriptive. Because believe it or not, to be focused upon as a sheep was a very beautiful thing. You know, it, it was magnificent. Now, understand... Here's what it says, Song of Songs, chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. Are you there? Now, some of you, well, I hardly ever go to the book of Songs. But here it goes, how beautiful you are. How what? So Rachel was stunningly beautiful. Like her relative Sarah. Sarah was beautiful even when she was 100 years old. And so you see some of the same genes falling through here in this relative. It says, oh, how beautiful your eyes behind your veil are like doves. Now, that's pretty romantic. But then it switches. Your hair is like a flock of goats. Now, I don't think that my wife would be too cunning and say, honey, you look like a flock of goats this morning. But it was a beautiful experience. Your hair is like a flock of goats descending from Mount Gilead. Your, your I can't, I'm sorry, I'm having a tough time. Your teeth, <laughs> your teeth are like a flock of sheep just shorn. Now I suppose that the sheep just shorn was beautiful pearly whites. You know what I mean? You know you could say that your teeth are about as beautiful as white as pearls. Now that's kind of exciting. But I don't know if I could say that your teeth look like sheep and be able to get away with it. But here's what we do know about Rachel. Jacob loved Rachel, and she was a very beautiful woman. And I want to tell you, all mothers are beautiful. Ah, oh, that was so weak. Oh, husbands, I, 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 I have pity on you right now. 
all mothers are beautiful. And here we are focusing upon the greatest day, one of the greatest days, and that's Mother's Day. And so here in the scripture, we recognize that Rachel is very beautiful. What we also know about Rachel, and it's kind of sad that she was used by her father. Now, I want you to understand, as we take a look at our scripture here, please, let's look at this. She was used by her father. Now, Jacob comes into the picture at the well. When Jacob sees Rachel, he is so excited. He has come to his relatives. He has sees this beautiful woman and finds out that she's daughter number two. Now, for us in the Western culture, that doesn't mean anything. But in Eastern culture, in, in Jewish culture, the first child has to be married first. Are you with me? Has to be married first. Matter of fact, Laban will say it's not our custom that the second should be. But then I begin to see that he realizes this custom, but he is in love with Rachel. And he's willing to do just about anything. And Laban uses that for his advantage. That's pretty sad. It's pretty sad that when you take a look at that, that he would do that. But you have to understand that it was a plan that if I work for you seven years, maybe we can forget about customs. If I put in seven years... Now, it was common for a man who had nothing to prove that he could make a living for his, his, his bride-to-be. So she would, or he would then have to work. But the seven years was not only just to show that he was worthy of Rachel, but it was also to bribe Laban that maybe the second one can go first. Well, Laban takes that to his advantage. Now, you would have to imagine that Rachel believes that she's going to marry Jacob. Would you agree? That is up to the wedding night. And on that wedding night... Laban pulls her out and substitutes Leah. Now, I think that if Rachel would have known that, that she probably would have snuck out and got word to Jacob, but she didn't know. So when you think about it, being used by your father brings a bad taste in your mouth. And as we find out, it brought a bad taste in Jacob's mouth, too. In, in, in the book, Patriots and Prophets, it's very clear. When it says here on page 189, it says that the fact that Leah herself was party to the cheat caused Jacob to feel that he could not love Leah. His indignant rebuke to Laban was met with the offer of Rachel for another seven years. And so you find that here she was done wrong. Would you agree that she was done wrong? I mean, this was peer out deceit. But this happens to be, as we will find out, one of the greatest mothers of Israel. What else do we know? We know that her marriage suffered. For here it is once again. We know this. For it says, Jacob was thus placed in the most painful and trying position. He finally decided to retain Leah and marry Rachel. Rachel was ever the one best loved, but his preference for her exercised envy and jealousy and his life was embittered by the rivalry between the two sisters. There, is not, there was no happiness in the home. 
And to top it off, she couldn't have children. Leah did. Leah started, I hate to use this, but started pumping out the children. <laughs> My wife just gave me the eye. <laughs> the children just kept coming. Is that better? So the children just kept arriving, and she had nothing. So she suffered. Matter of fact, Genesis chapter 30. Genesis chapter 30. She gets upset at her husband, verse 2, or verse 1, says, When Rachel saw that she was not bearing Jacob any children, she became jealous of her sister. That she said to Jacob, Give me children or I die. And, and Jacob gets mad. Wait a minute here. Am I God? So there's a little bit of a tussle in this marriage. And I want to tell you something else. And this one should be obvious. There should only be one woman in the home. Amen. There should only be one woman in the home. Amen. I tell you what, we can only handle one, amen? amen. <laughs> only one can be handled. Think about two. There's a problem for the rest of his life. But notice that this comes out. Notice this in verse 27, chapter 30, verse 27. Then God remembered Rachel. I want to let you know, mothers, you are remembered by God. Yes. Then God remembered Rachel and he listened to her. Did you hear that word? I, 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 that word just jumps right off of the page. He listened to her, which implies that she prayed to him. And all good mothers need to be on their knees. I want to tell you the strength of their children is because their mother was praying for them. And so Rachel becomes a mother who prayed for her children before they were ever born. Now there's something else that you have to take into consideration. She prays a prayer of faith. What type of prayer? Of faith. Because it said that God listens. Now you think about this. God says if you have the faith of a what? You could tell this mountain to move and it would. So it tells me that Rachel becomes a woman, a mother of faith, who prays and God listens. Now that's just not one person. That's every mother here today. Every mother can get on their knees and in faith pray and God will listen. How many moms have prayed for their sons or daughters that were in battle? How many parents felt the urge to get out of bed and pray for their children, not knowing why, but something was about ready to happen, their intuition kicked in, and they get out of bed and they pray, God, I know that you're going to take care of my children. And the God of heaven listens. All of a sudden, the mother of Rachel takes on new meaning. She's not just this pretty young lady with no substance to her. It's not just a lady that Jacob looked at and said, I'm in love with her. But it's a woman who battled in her marriage. And she used by her father, praise. I want to tell you what many people today, mothers today, us men have little understanding of the depths of field that they, or the depths that they go into. The emotions and the feelings that mothers have far exceed what a man can understand. Are you with me? When a mom is with her child or a mother is thinking, the depth that she feels, I don't believe, can fully be understood by the husband. That's why they have God to. Because God, the Father, understands the mother's feelings. Men, how many times have you heard your spouse say, you just don't understand how many? Have you? Can I raise both hands? 
how many times? You just don't understand what I'm going through. And she's correct. And the last thing you need to do is to try to come up with a, a solution. <laughs> well, if all you if you just did, oh, <laughs> pastor's hung out to dry. What's that guy hanging on the tree out there? Or what's that guy doing living in the doghouse? Try to explain a mother's feelings, and I'm going to guarantee you, you'll be in the doghouse. But try to understand and say, you know what? I'm with you. I can't reach, but I'm here to support you. Isn't that the greatest thing? Yeah. Rachel suffered in her marriage, and that's for sure. But the beauty of it is that God was with her. Then God remembered Rachel, and he listened to her and opened her womb, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son and said, oh, hey, listen to this. God has taken away my disgrace. Oh, did you catch that? God, not Jacob, but God listened to me. Now, you may not be a physical mother, but God listens to you. You may be the mother of Israel here in the Apopka church. You may not have children, but you have children all around you. And God listens to you. God has taken away my disgrace. She named him Joseph and said, May the Lord add to me another son, a prayer in faith. Did God answer that? So what do we know? Is that she suffered in her marriage, but here's something else. Her mourning is noted. In Scripture. Now, pa Pastor, I'm not sure what you, what you mean by that. Let's go over here to verse 35, chapter 35. Let's, let's run over there real quick. In chapter 35, they're on their way, and they have just passed through Ramah. Bible students, that name should trickle something that's in the back of your mind. Rama. I'll come back to that. But they, Rachel began to give birth and had great difficulty, and she was having great difficulty in childbirth. The midwife said to her, Don't be afraid, for you have another son. As she breathed her last, for she was dying, she named her son, her son Benoni, which means... It doesn't mean Benjamin, but it means son of my suffering. sorrow. Suffering is correct. That's a great translation. Son of my suffering. Do you know what she's saying? Listen to this. On her deathbed, as she is in pain, she calls her son Benoni. What she's really telling Jacob is that my life with you has been a living hell. Whoa! And she is correct. Jacob could not handle that. And that's why you see from here on out, Jacob will do everything in his power to lift the name of Rachel. No, he will not be son of my suffering. He will be Benjamin. And from that moment on, he does everything that he can to elevate Rachel above Leah. And Leah, by the way, is found in the tomb of the patriarchs, but she is found in a grave out of Bethlehem. Oh, wait a minute. Rama, Bethlehem. Have you heard that before? For those that haven't, go here to Matthew. Take a look at what Matthew has to say about this. Matthew is quite interesting. Look what it says. 
Matthew chapter 2, verse 18. You have to see it. It's a prophecy. It is in the prophecy of the fulfilled. You see, Matthew reveals to us how Jesus fulfilled Bible prophecy or how Bible was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. But notice what it says, verse 17, that what was said through the prophet Jeremiah may be fulfilled because Herod had just killed all the children to and under. And what does it say? A voice heard in where? Ah, there it is. A voice heard in Rama weeping and great mourning. Rachel named. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Rachel's mourning is noted in Scripture, the life of pain that she went through. And what, what is saying, what Matthew is saying, is if you want to understand what mourning is, go back to what Rachel went through. Look at the, the, the misery that Rachel faced. Now, before we say, well, pastor, this is a pretty downer of a sermon, I want to focus upon her qualities, and I want to focus upon her dedication, because if we take a look of what type of mother Rachel was, we have very little evidence of what the Bible has to say about her. But we have her children. Amen? Amen? We have her children. And one other thing that I forgot. Though Rachel is now buried in Bethlehem, one mile north of Bethlehem, 11 miles out of Rama. It is understood that she would probably die right out of Rama and was buried in Bethlehem, where Jacob put up a tomb, the Bible says, that is there to this day. Now we know that Ezekiel or Ezra uh, edited that stuff, so in the time of after Babylonian captivity, her grave was still there. And what I find interesting as I started looking into Rachel's tomb, if you Google this, and some of you are probably checking me out right now, but if you Google this, you'll find that this is a, one of a pilgrimage that has great results. People from all over go to visit Rachel's tomb. Now you have to ask yourself, why? Why would they visit her tomb? And you, you have to come to the conclusion that she was an outstanding mother. Would you agree with that? Little is said about her being a mother, but you have to understand who, who were her children. Which brings us to the second part, our last part of the story of Rachel, and that's Rachel's dedication. Now, the question is, is how do we see that dedication? We see that in her sons. So the question, and I wrote down a few of them here, where did he get the ability to be a strong role model, Joseph? Where did he get that ability? I want to tell you, my wife, has been the strongest role model for my girls. From very early age, she put them up in front of people to read the scriptures like we heard today. My youngest, my oldest daughter, Katie, put into playing violin lessons in age of three. It's a long time ago. Both of my girls have went into music because it was a part of their education. My wife says, listen, don't ever take no for an answer. And look at Joseph, never took no for an answer. Well, what else did I put? It says, he learned to prioritize his time. Where did he get that skill? It had to go back to his mother. You think about the, the hell that the mother went through, and yet they're wonderful children. These children are still talked about today. And even though Benjamin was born at birth, 
I mean, she died at birth, didn't get a chance to know the mother. Her DNA lived on. Because Benjamin is known by Jacob as a ravenous wolf. And you know what that means in Hebrew? A champion. She had a champion and a leader of a country. Isn't that a powerful? Where did they get that? They got it from Rachel. How did Joseph learn to be a man of integrity? And I hate to say this, he didn't learn that from his father. He didn't. Maybe later on in life, but not in the informative years. In Joseph's informative years, he learned to be a man of integrity And it's my belief because the mother was a woman of integrity. What else? How did Joseph learn to navigate through his feelings? Do you you see what I'm saying? Twice rejected. How was he able to navigate through that? To be a strong leader in the the Egyptian world. More, More than that... God-chosen man becomes a strong leader in an atheistic secular society. Now that's power. That's something that he had to learn. But where did he learn that? I believe it was from Rachel. Another question. Who taught Joseph how to fail? But well, wait a minute here. Was Joseph a failure? Question, was Joseph a failure? Then why was he in jail? Was it his fault that he went to jail? But in the world, in the worldview, was he a failure? He was. But notice that he had to learn how to fail. Does that make sense? Because... When we fail, that's just evidence that we can win the next time. You know, I think of uh, Grant. I just read his book, Sherdown's book, on USS Grant. Grant always assumed that he was going to win. When they came up and says there was a devil to pay, Grant would say this, yeah, but we'll get him tomorrow. See, when you read the book of Grant, it's fascinating that he treated everyone with dignity. Believe it or not, you won't hear that. In Petersburg, he had a regiment of black soldiers. And many of them were captive or captured by the South. And here's what Grant did. He asked to release the prisoners. And Lee said, no. He said, yeah, I'll I'll give you only the white. And he said, no, the black are just as important as the white. He would not accept it unless they all came. Powerful. Powerful. So he, how did he learn to fail? Listen to this. Here are some quotes. I, I brought this up. Who said this? It is always, it always seems impossible until it's done. Do you know who said that? Nelson Mandela. It goes, if you're going through hell, keep going. Never, 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 never give up. Who's that? Winston Churchill. Notice this. You're going to find the people that make it work. Um, You're going to find the people that make it work never quit. Quitting is not an option. Bob Proctor, don't give up. I know from experience that you should never give up on yourself or others, no matter what. George Foreman. Here's one. A famous poet. The best way out is always through. The best way out is always through. Robert Frost. So many of these strong leaders never quit. And I believe that even though Rachel was going through everything, she never quit. 
And she instilled those characteristic traits in her children. When I think of Benjamin, you know what? He was a champion, even though he didn't have the ability to be mothered by his mother. He is known throughout the Bible as a champion. When you take a look at this picture, what hand is his spear in? What hand is his spear in? His left hand. That's unheard of. He was able to sidestep the enemy by having his left hand because everybody else fought with the right. So once again, you look at Rachel's children and you can say, wow, they were quality children. And I'm here to tell you the quality comes because they had a wonderful mother. When I think of Rachel, she's rarely talked about, but she's highly honored. In the Middle East, people go all over to see this wonderful lady, which they would call a mother in Israel. When you look at her children, they're still remembered today. The only ones that we remember the most from Leah is Judah, maybe Dan. But I will say that her dedication to her children is something to be honored. And may I publicly commit to you today that the mother of my children I highly honor. She has brought my girls through thick and thin. She has done more to build their character than their father ever has. Oh, I love my girls. But this woman has put her whole life on hold for these women, these young ladies here. She was going places until she met me. I can remember it well to this day. When I saw her, my heart skipped. Hers didn't. (laughs) She boldly told me that I'm never going to marry a pastor. I didn't know how to get out of that one. So I have to ask the Lord for a little help. But she was going to go, her career was set up to go all the way to a PhD in education. She had it all taken care of until she met me. I had the Lord's help, but she put all that aside to raise these girls. And I don't know how to say thank you. And I don't know to say how much I love her, because I do. Because I have some of the greatest children in the world. Now I know that my youngest daughter has something to say about that too. So I'm going to ask her to come forward at this time. Because she has something that she would like to share with her mother. Kayla. Miss, how to follow that, I don't know. My goodness, don't hear about make me cry for heaven's sake. But for my mother and for all mothers, it's so, it's so obvious to all of us. There is absolutely nothing in this world that they won't do for us. And we know that. You cannot question that. And the love, the time, everything, their lives that they put out there for all of us so that we can succeed it's beyond description. It's beyond recognition. There's nothing we can do to say thank you. 